I had my mom on a huge pedestal from the time I was a kid. I mean, she was beautiful. I just wanted to be her so bad because she was amazing to me. I can't sew a straight seam to save my life, and I tried in home ec to be a good cook and a good seamstress, but honestly, I hated it. That was kind of a big shoe to fill as a girl, to be like my mom, to garden, to cook, to can, freeze. Welcome to the Brand New Me Podcast. I'm Frances. And I'm Pam. And we are two Two women women passionate passionate about helping others thrive in life, not just survive. In each episode, we're going to find creative ways to offer hope for your future through our own life experiences. So join us every week as we learn together that we really can be a brand new new me. a child, my mom, I'm telling you, she was amazing in the whole creativity department. She, well, she was an artist and she was flamboyant and creative and awesome. And she would do a lot of different things with me. But one thing I remember so clearly is at Christmas, she was having this Christmas party at our house and I was helping her get ready for this and we dyed bread (laughs) Bread and green. Now, this is back many, many years ago. Dyed bread and then made these, like, Christmas tree sandwiches, and it was very exciting. And then the other thing she did, which I never forgot, which is interesting because I haven't done with my grandkids yet, but next year I'm going to do it. So you take an ice cream cone, and you make get icing, and you turn it green, and all that you do is just put the icing on this ice cream cone and, you know, try to make branches or whatever. And then you put those little silver balls on it. And that was her little favor. And I just was so amazed by that when I was a kid. I thought, my mom is the greatest. So she cultivated creativity in me, I think, by just doing some of the things that she did. So did your mom cultivate creativity? Boy, I'm glad I'm editing this. So did your mom create... Oh, my gosh. I'm not putting all this... Did your mom cultivate creativity in you, Frances? Oh, my, I remember those little silver balls on those cookies. I forgot all about them. Like, you could eat them, right? sure. Yeah, I forgot all about those. See, people probably still use those, but my husband does not like anything but chocolate chip cookies. So I've gotten out of practice of making any kind of Christmas cookies. So I just assume they no longer exist. But yes, my mother had her own creativity. She was definitely an amazing cook who would create a seven, eight course meal and everything was homegrown and home raised and homemade. And it was a big production for us to have people over. She got out her best china, her silverware box, and I'd open that and I'd set, it was my job to set the table. She'd make creative centerpieces out of pretty much nothing, but pine tree branches. She was just creative with very little resources. She could sew. I can't, I can't sew a straight seam to save my life. And I tried in home ec to be a good cook and a good seamstress, but Honestly, I hated it. Did she cultivate creativity? That's an interesting question. She modeled creative homemaking. Can I say that? She often would just say, why don't you go and practice the piano or play the piano and I'll work on dinner. And that's where my creativity came out. She wasn't creative on the piano, but she nurtured mine. I'll I'll say that. Uh, I was more creative when I was ice skating, I'd try to dance and make up choreography, and I tried to create little shows. And she wasn't a painter and that kind of art artistry kind of stuff. But I can see her dyeing bread Christmas color. 
I don't know about you, but that was kind of a big shoe to fill as a girl to be like my mom, to garden, to cook, to can, freeze, hostess people. So what was it like for you to grow up with an artistic mother? Did you feel like you had to compete with that? Oh, totally. I had my mom on a huge pedestal from the time I was a kid. I mean, she was beautiful. They would go out dancing on Saturday nights. And, you know, they weren't Christians at that time, so they did the dancing and drinking thing. <laughs> As if dancing at the point. No, no, not. The, but they, that's what they did. Mm-hmm. And she would dress to the nines. I mean, she, and she would have these outfits, and she'd have these hats. And, you know, I just wanted to be her so bad because she was amazing to me. That's what was exciting. You know, she worked, and she worked full time, and I remember her working second shift uh, at one point when I was a kid. And on Friday nights, I got to stay up and wait for her to come home. And when she came home, and I think I talked about this before, I'd have a party ready for her. I thought she was the cat's meow, if I may say. (laughs) So yes, for me to say, wow, I really want to be like my mom. And that kind of continues on through your life. You know, you feel like, man, I boy, I wish I could do that, or I wish I could do that. And so that brings us to another level of this that Brene talks about, and that is letting go of comparison. You know, comparison, it's all about conformity, and it's all about competition. And the scripture clearly says about competition and comparing ourselves to one another. Would you mind reading that verse? It's from 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Wow, that's a mouthful. Yeah, basically, if we're going to start comparing ourselves with each other, that's just not going to take us down a good road, especially when we're using ourselves as our measuring stick. (laughs) Or each other as a measuring stick. If I compare my cooking to my mother's, I will never measure up. But I've learned to be comfortable with my cooking abilities and learning how to get better. But I will never be her. But it took me 40 years to work through that and be okay with that. So let's talk about a little bit about when this comparison thing starts. I was thinking about it, and at first I thought... I, I bet it starts in middle school, junior high school. Mm. And then I had to think back, and I remember a story. And this was first grade. There was a girl in my class. Her name was Kathy. And I just thought she was awesome. And so Kathy decides to get a pixie haircut. Now, <laughs> you have to be older to understand what a pixie haircut is. It's just this really short haircut. And it was cute. And so she gets this pixie haircut. Well, I had to have a pixie haircut. So I begged my mom, oh, please, I want to get a pixie haircut. So here I am comparing myself with Kathy. So I get this pixie haircut. (laughs) I looked off. (laughs) And I bawled and bawled and bawled because I didn't look like her with my pixie haircut. Look how young I was. That was the first comparison time. And, you know, you can go through middle school and high school and there can be comparisons out the old wazoo. I love this. Uh, This is just a a quote that she says, the comparison mandate becomes this crushing paradox of fit in or stand out. It's not called cultivating self-acceptance, belonging, authenticity. It's be just like everyone else, but better. Mm. So that was my experience in the beginning of comparison. And it's hard for kids it's hard for kids. They're comparing what shoes they have on. They're comparing, do you have a phone? Do you not have a phone? It's very difficult, I believe, it, even more so these days. Well, speaking of comparison, I just told you when we weren't recording that I'm reading the autobiography of the musician and author, Jewel. And I don't really know her music, but I love to read stories of famous musicians and I found her book in the library and it is such a good book and I'm reading it again actually but it's called Never Broken and wouldn't you know she has a chapter in there called I think it's called Are You Getting Your Teeth Fixed and I just couldn't believe it when I read it because I've always 
hated my teeth. And when I, I've talked about this before, I've never gotten my teeth fixed. And so when I have pictures taken for my, my albums and website, whatever, I tend not to show my teeth because I hate them. And wouldn't you know, she has crooked teeth. And I did notice that in her pictures. And she talks about that in her book and how when she started to become well-known, somebody outright said, she's going to fix her teeth, right? And she never did, at least that I know of so far. And then wouldn't you know, she got a role in a movie. And when she asked how it was that she got to get that role, he said it, it was your teeth. He wanted somebody that looked just like her for this role. And I just, there was an immediate connection with her because of that. Uh, there's someone else who doesn't like their teeth. And when we first, probably nobody notices, but we had different pictures put up for our podcast, like a year into our podcast. And I look at that picture of you, Pam, and I just think your teeth are so beautiful in that picture. But if anybody notices, I do not show my teeth in that picture. So we have a picture of us together. My producer put us together, but I'm not showing my teeth and you are. (laughs) I just thought, there you have it. If ever I compare myself with people, the first thing I tend to do is look at their teeth and think, oh, I wish I had their teeth. And I'm having to learn to be content with my teeth. I've talked to my dentist about getting mine fixed, but apparently it's a complicated thing because of the way my jaw is shaped and my my teeth are so badly messed up as far as underbite and all that. It would be a major undertaking for me to get them fixed. So I'm just going to live with my teeth the way they are. <laughs> so how's that for transparency? I love it. But interestingly enough, with Jewel, when I would see her, I admired that about her. Hmm. That she did have this crooked tooth or crooked teeth and that she didn't get them fixed and look like everybody else. It's one thing I do remember about her. Mm. So we're talking about comparison, and one of the quotes that she talks about is, comparison is the thief of happiness. Oh, my goodness. The thief of happiness. When we do compare ourselves among ourselves, then we start to feel inadequate. We start to feel bad about ourselves. And so it take it does take away our happiness. Mm. Brene sums up, What she's learned about creativity in her research and in her living, three things. Number one, I'm not very creative doesn't work. There's no such thing as creative people and non-creative people. There are only people who use their creativity and people who don't. Unused creativity doesn't just disappear. It lives within us until it's expressed, neglected to death, or suffocated by resentment and fear. Number two, the only unique contribution that we will ever make in this world will be born of our creativity. Hmm. Number three, if we want to make meaning, we need to make art. Cook, write, draw, doodle, paint, scrapbook, take pictures, collage, knit, rebuild an engine. I don't think so. (laughs) Sculpt, dance, decorate, act, sing. It doesn't matter. As long as we're creating, we're cultivating meaning. That reminds me reading about the sculpting. Jewel took a sculpting class in college. Actually, she began, I think she began to really major and focus in it. And she said she learned more about writing and songwriting by sculpting than any other thing, which made me tempted (laughs) to go learn something new like sculpting but I have had an interest in photography in learning more about photography because there's a direct correlation to me between music and images I don't have time to go learn photography and videography but I am very interested in that art form and I think the two really go together that's where I'd say I'd probably be more interested in learning a new form of art Not cooking, knitting, no thanks. But maybe sculpting. I don't know. That sounded interesting to me. How about you? Well, while I was away this weekend, they had a little line dancing thing. And I just tell you, I love to dance. And it was so much fun. I mean, it's something about it just brings joy. Because I remembered, you know, when I was singing with Sweet Adelines, I sang with them for 21 years. We didn't just sing. We danced. And it... 
it was really enjoyable and really fun to me. So maybe I'll just go out every Saturday night and kick up my heels. Who knows? (laughs) Okay, you can kick up your heels while I go chisel rock. (laughs) And what are our husbands going to (laughs) do? I don't know. And Tom will ride his motorcycle. I know that. So Brene says to get deliberate. These are her dig deeper things that we always close with. Carve out a time to be creative. Hmm. For me, that just means I need to be sure I'm carving out songwriting time, piano, playing the piano for fun, and developing more of that combination of music with with images. Why don't you give a couple of the other dig deep points that she gives? Another one is get inspired. And she's talking about you know, hang with people of like spirit. Like if you want to go out and... Or if I want to go out and dance or you want to go out and sculpt, find somebody who does that and let them inspire you to do it. Just like writers or, you know, songwriters or whatever. Isn't it fun to be with people who share the same thoughts and feelings that you do? And I think that's kind of neat. And of course, the last thing, get going. And she said, if you really want to do something, you can't sit on the couch and talk about it and think about it for years. (laughs) You have to go to a class and do it. She's saying, if you want to do something, you just go do it. Here's a song to send you out for your day. It's called This Could Be Your Day. You can find it on YouTube. Just type in This Could Be Your Day. It's just released by Chris Rodriguez. Now, he's singing it. He's uh, been a vocalist and guitarist for people like Peter Cetera, Kenny Loggins, Keith Urban. But this is him singing a song my producer, Eric Copeland from Creative Soul Records, wrote. It's a great song. It's a lot of fun, encouraging us to just play, be lazy, do something great. And this could be your day. Wake up, brew you up a cake up. Look out if the sun's up. This could be your day. Up high, nothing but a blue sky. Where the man says all dry. This could be your day No work, get your favorite t-shirt You're a Mr. Bluebird, sing your favorite song Top down, wind is blowing all around No traffic heading uptown Nothing could go wrong I'm too Fun. Mm-hmm.